Hi, I'm Lindsay Bridges, and this is where I would usually say, welcome to addressing the elephant in the room. But we've had a bit of a makeover with our podcast for 2022, mainly thanks to you, our amazing bunch of growing listeners from around the world. We're going to be growing in the topics that we talk about this year. We've grown in our listener base. So we thought it was time to just rebrand the podcast a little bit. We're going to be calling it Speaking Up. And actually, that's because, as you'd expect with a name like that, we're speaking up about a wide range of DNI issues from around the globe. So let's get stuck into the first episode. I'm truly excited today to be talking to Freya Levy. If you're a fan of wheelchair basketball, rugby or ice hockey, well, you might have heard of her. And we're going to be talking about intersectionality in the workplace. But more of that in a moment. Let's jump straight in. Freya, thank you so much for joining me today. And I just want to start with one simple question. What's your story? Yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, So my story is when... When I was 14 years old, um, I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, which is a progressive muscle wasting condition. So as I get older, my muscles uh, gradually waste away and that's left me as a full-time wheelchair user, um, along with a lot of other struggles. You know, I can't lift my arms above my head. I can't smile or wink or close my eyes at night to sleep due to the muscle wastage. So there's definitely been a lot of challenges to overcome through that. Um, Thankfully, I found sport during that process, which helped me come to terms with that and, and, you know, really find, find a route to achieve. Um, and I've gone on to, to, yeah, represent my country in four different sports, which I'm hugely proud of. Freya, in, in just in day to day life, I'm, I am really curious, how, how easy or difficult is it for you just to get around and do, do what I would find to be normal, if you don't mind me saying it that way? Absolutely. There's there's a lot of challenges. And, and I think as I've kind of got older, I think maybe and not not necessarily in the right way, but I guess I've brushed brushed a lot off and, and you kind of just like you get used to um, discrimination in a way which sounds terrible uh, and not very positive at all. But, you know, for example, you go out for a night out in London and, and you can't get a taxi to, to put their ramp out for you or um you know, I go out to my friends with a restaurant and for me personally, like I don't feel disabled. I feel like sometimes society disables me. So if I go to a restaurant with my friends and, and there's no ramp to get in, then the only thing that's disabled me was, was the ramp or the lack of ramp, should I say, because up to that point, you know, I've got dressed, I've got in my car, I've, I've left my house and, and gone to, to the restaurant. But with, with no challenges at all in that sense. So it's only when, when you face those barriers that you realise that they disable you rather than, than uh, my disability itself. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have an adapted house and, and a partner that's, that's happy to help and a dog that's trained to, to help with certain things. So they all mitigate a lot of the challenges that I face day to day that, that don't make them challenges anymore, I guess. So I think, yeah, sometimes it's incredibly challenging, but I also think... Um, you do kind of brush a lot of it off, um, which we shouldn't really, but but it helps get through the day, I guess. I guess that's a coping mechanism, isn't it, in terms of actually just kind of almost accepting it. You've, you've probably over time lowered your standards almost in terms of what you expect. But And for me, i got to admit, as an able-bodied individual, I, I wouldn't think about that. And it maybe makes me think that I should think about it a little bit more. And if we all thought a little bit more, maybe the world would change. Absolutely. You know, there's there's things day to day that, that I struggle with. Like I say, I can't lift my arms above my chest. So getting dressed or, or reaching for things in, in the kitchen, in, in the bedroom, like they're, they're all struggles. But um, but for me, I think that's why I find sport so important. And that's why I find being able to achieve um, in sport or in the workplace and just have like an, a normal as such life outside of those challenges really helps to cope with that sort of stuff because you know I can still fit into society in those ways regardless of the challenges that I'm facing uh, on day to day and I like to think that I'll be able to I've been able to create a life where you know 
when you go to bed at night, you might leave your slippers by the bed. Well, I just leave my chair at the side of my bed. So I think I like to think of it like that. And, and those challenges that I do face just, you know, everyone's got their struggles. Everyone uh, has things they have to overcome. And, and I guess some of those are just mine, you know. Oh, that's fascinating to hear about that, Freya. Thank you. What I'd really like to, to talk about and move us on to, though, is this concept of intersectionality. And, you know, that's a concept coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 1980s. And, and I understand this to be um, the sort of the concept that people can be in more than one diversity line. You know, they can be black and female or in your case, female and disabled. And I'm really curious to know how you see this relating to you. Absolutely. You know, um, not only am I female, I'm, I'm also disabled. Um, I have a girlfriend, so I'm in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and I'm also Jewish. And, you know, I've experienced a lot of bias on, on all levels. So, um, so yeah, I do feel like I fall into quite a few of the DNI categories. Um, and, and how they interlink is, is definitely important. When I was a lot younger, I experienced some anti-Semitism um, and you know, as, I, as I'm getting older, there's a lot of bias around being disabled in sport, sometimes being a female. Um, I think probably one of the best examples I can I can think of is, is when I first started playing wheelchair rugby sevens and I was playing uh, for England against France. And the French coach, like he's a really lovely guy, I know him really well, but he came over to me and he was like, don't worry when you're on the pitch, we'll put our female player on the pitch and it'll be nice and equal and like there was just already a perception that I wouldn't be as capable as the rest of the team and, and therefore different. Um, and I was very grateful to be able to prove him wrong because later on in the game, like their female player wasn't on when I was on and it was just back to that level playing field. So there's there's been a lot of times where it's a challenge. And I think in the sporting world, that's where I enjoy the fact that your performance does the talking. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about, you know, addressing those issues verbally. You can just show them what you can do and, I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to have broken down some barriers in, in that area. What a great example um, in terms of how your contribution does the talking. But Freya, tell me a little bit more about, you know, has that, has that bias that you've experienced changed over the years? And do you see that different now? Absolutely. Um, I think now, especially there's a lot more education on, on the subject and that's helped me kind of figure out the the scenarios I've faced and it's definitely not always something you see in the moment and it, and it is a lot on reflection and and how that necessarily made me feel that I didn't realize um but I think that comes down to a lot of of the education that is on the subject now which which has been fantastic to bring it to the forefront um especially around some of the other issues you know like when I've faced some anti-semitism or homophobia they're not necessarily something you see in the moment and you know, the term banter has changed quite a lot and, and a lot of things that you see, we used to see as maybe banter are definitely, um, they're a bit more hurtful these days, I guess. So um, that's, yeah, a lot of reflection has gone into that. And, and at the time I, I knew that it was maybe a bias being placed on me because of my gender rather than because of my disability or my religion or, or you know, sexual orientation. So they don't always intercross, but, but um yeah, it's, it's, it's been a challenge, but um, that's, like I say, like you can, you can use your performance to, to kind of do the talking for you in those instances. And that's definitely been really helpful in, in my career so far. It sounds to me like you've found some really, really strong ways to get over some of those challenges yourself. But, um, but that, that aspect of, of, of banter and, and banter in sport in particular, what more do you think we just as, as people in the world need to do to actually sort of, you know, really stamp that out and make, make people feel, you know, feel good about what they do? Yeah, it's a tricky one, I guess, because um, everyone's got different levels of what they maybe see as banter. And it, it's been highlighted a lot, especially in the cricket, in the world of cricket lately. So I think especially in the sports sector, it's the the lines are very grey and, and it's really hard to see. But um, I think that's where conversations and education are so important. You know, um, we've got to take care of each other's mental health and the way things might make us feel. And that might differ day to day. So 
I think that's why conversations are so important and honesty is so important. You know, we've got to be open about how we're feeling and about how things might have affected us. And I think um, that's where reflection comes in as well. You know, we've got to look back on some some things we might have done in the past and, and see why they were wrong now. So um, and grow from that, definitely. I think you make some good points there about what might have been acceptable in the past, isn't now? And, and it's interesting... Um, one of the things I was thinking about in preparing for, for meeting with you today was, was, was this concept of labels. And I'm really curious to your view, you know, how do you feel when I, when I, you know, when someone talks to you about being disabled, is that a, is that labeling, is that a difficult for you? Is that something that you just accept? I'm very curious to know. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, I, I don't see language as, as a barrier. I don't see labels as a barrier, you know, um, especially when it comes to words like able-bodied, disabled, you know, I don't, for me personally, I don't think they, they mean any difference. So um, I know that some able-bodied people may not be able to do some things that I can do as a disabled person. So that's where um, I think sometimes it can get a bit tricky around language. But I, th I think it's important that everyone addresses everyone as individuals because, you know, for me, I use the terms like jump in the shower, run to the shops and you know, I, I can't use my legs. So obviously I can't do those things, but I, I don't see it as like a negative. I don't see it as a barrier. I think language is quite fluid and, and we can use it in, in lots of different ways. So I don't see disabled as a negative word. I don't see wheelchair as a negative word, but it's maybe sometimes the perceptions around those words that, that need to be changed rather than the word itself. Yeah, that's that's a really valid point because sometimes when you say a word, it conjures up an image, doesn't it? And it's about making sure that we we take away our own unconscious biases around those images, I suppose is what's important. So you've now joined DHL and you've joined our marketing team. And I'm really, really interested to know your view on what is it organizations can do to sort of build more of an inclusive culture within their businesses? Yeah, I think DHL does a, does a fantastic job, um, especially with podcasts like this, you know, it's a, it's a great job to educate and especially through the employment process, um, like there wasn't necessarily questions that were barriers at the start, um, which I've had in the past where, you know, um, I've, I've had to tick disabled or, or dis I have a disability and then I've not got any further in that application process. And, I, you know, they they can't say that it was because I was disabled, but it's always in the back of your head. Like, is this why? So I think the fact that especially through through the application stages and things like that it was very late stage and that doesn't mean it's not important it just means that like you were saying about unconscious bias you know we don't want to form these opinions of uh, cvs in our head before we actually meet the person and as a as a community as a disabled person like we have a lot of strengths um because of our resilience that we have to face day to day and and our problem solving skills and there's a lot of strengths that come from some of the attributes that that people may see as struggles but but you know I see them as strengths so I think that really helped in in the sense that we're not forming these pictures of people before we meet them um just off of words on a page or a box tit saying that you have a disability and it's definitely a positive coming through the experience of applying at DHL. That's great to hear and really really sort of insightful feedback around thinking about how we manage our recruitment processes generally as organizations. But, but actually, I love the way you flip it around and you talk about the positives that you see in terms of strengths of resilience and problem solving. I think that's a really, really cool way to look at things. If I think now and move on to advice to our listeners, um, what, what is it that individuals may be listening to this podcast what could they do to be better allies to to people like yourself? I think the biggest thing is is conversation, um, conversation and education. Like it's it sounds really simple, but but it it really helps. You know, it's everyone's got an individual perspective. For me, I see my disability as a positive. I see it as the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think that some people may find that uncomfortable or confusing, but. I think when you open that conversation and, and you approach it with, with honesty, um, you can really break down some of them, maybe preconceptions or, or stereotypes or, um, around people with disabilities or people in any other sector of, of DNI. So I, I think that is definitely a key point to, 
to just not be afraid to ask those questions. You know, the worst worst answer you're going to get back is like, I'm not comfortable talking about that. And then that's where you know where the, the kind of um, boundary is. But for me, you know, I'm, I'm more, very comfortable talking about it. And, and that's why there's it's, it's always on an individual basis because some people might not be and that's absolutely OK. Um, but for me personally, I think it, it only helps open the conversation even wider and helps to educate people a, a little bit more on those things. Do you find, Freya, you've travelled the world a lot um, through sport. Do you find that you get different responses or reactions in different countries or cultures? I think so, definitely. And I, I don't know if that's maybe because, you know, some countries are maybe a bit further behind on, on their DNA journey, I guess, if, if we could call it that. So, yeah, I've experienced um, some challenges in different countries I've travelled to and in the way that they approach, is especially uh, disability. And I think that one's always really key for me because it's visible. You know, mm-hmm. uh, when you look at me, you can see I'm in a wheelchair. You can see that I'm disabled, but you can't necessarily see that, you know, um, I'm Jewish or I have a, a girlfriend. So I think that's why that's always the one at the forefront of me for me in terms of challenging those preconceptions or those stereotypes, because, you know, it's the most visible one. I, I can't hide the fact that I'm a female and I'm in a wheelchair. You know, you see it as soon as you see me. So um, I've definitely experienced some challenges because of those visible uh, characteristics, I guess. That's interesting, isn't it? And particularly that visible versus hidden hidden uh, diversity lines is something that I think we all probably need to think about a little bit more actively. So, Freya, I'm going to start to bring the conversation to a close. But before I do, I've got a bit of a quick fire round for you. That's new in this series of the podcast. I've got five quick fire questions and I'd really like some short, you know, one or two word answers from you. So are you ready to go with this? Absolutely. Yeah, let's give it a go. Okay, so first one, what does diversity mean to you? I think it means equity. If I had to choose one word, I think it would mean equity. Brilliant, thank you, equity. And so what about the biggest area of change in diversity and inclusion in the past few years? Uh, I think it's, it's bringing to the conversation, you know, it's opened the door to the conversation and it's, it's bringing disability into that conversation a lot of time. Yeah, it can be left out. And if we stop looking backwards now and look forward, how do you see the future of diversity and inclusion? Very positive, definitely. It's it's exciting to, to think that, that we're on the right path uh, and it's very optimistic. Brilliant, positive and optimistic. What does inclusion mean to you? I think it's a safe space, <clears throat> a safe space that everyone can achieve to their full potential. Brilliant, thank you for that. And the last one, what's your favourite podcast? <laughs> Absolutely this one. Absolutely this one. And I, I love listening to podcasts on the way to training. So um so yeah, this is up there on the on the ones I listen to a lot. Brilliant. But you had to say that, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Freya Levy, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really, really enjoyed listening to your story. The the resilience, the tenacity you've shown um since your, your diagnosis at the age of fourteen. But actually what really, really stands out for me is your positive optimistic outlook i must admit i can't imagine um how how you actually manage day to day and how you can turn what has been a life-changing event for you into something that is so positive so optimistic and i really really admire that in you appreciate your time today thank you for joining us on the program thank you so much for having me so that's it for today's episode Look out for us next month when I'm going to be talking to some of our college graduates and listening to them talk about their desire for a more equitable world. And in the meantime, you can listen to us on Spotify, on Apple or on YouTube. Many thanks.